This is the final video in the seven video series on antiarrhythmics. The topic is an overview of drug selection, some classic antiarrhythmic pitfalls, and a brief summary. So I'm going to go through some common clinical scenarios involving arrhythmias and discuss the consideration one should have when choosing a specific drug. First up is the most common, how to rate control rapid AFib or A flutter. The first consideration is whether you are dealing with an inpatient in whom you are just attempting to stabilize temporarily while figuring out the long-term plan, or if you're dealing with an outpatient or soon to be discharged inpatient and need to determine what that long-term plan is. For the acute inpatient, ask whether there is evidence of heart failure or LV dysfunction. If no, then diltiazem, verapamil, and cardioselective beta blockers are all appropriate options. There is some evidence, which is consistent with my personal experience, that IV diltiazem may be the most effective medication for acute rate control. Now, if there is heart failure or LV dysfunction, those meds are relatively contraindicated because they are all negative inotropes. So options in this case include amiodarone and digoxin, as well as cardioversion. Keep in mind that amiodarone carries the risk of pharmacologically cardioverting the patient back to sinus, which may or may not be desirable, depending on how long the patient has been in AFib or A-flutter, and whether they have been adequately anticoagulated. Also, digoxin has a long onset of action, even when loaded, and it will definitely be the slowest of any of these options at getting the rate under control. For outpatients and or a long-term rate control strategy, once again, consider heart failure or LV dysfunction. If there's none, diltiazem, verapamil, and beta blockers are all appropriate options. If there is heart failure or LV dysfunction, beta blockers are clearly first line with digoxin a distant second. Remember that we want to avoid long-term amiodarone due to its toxicity like pulmonary fibrosis. Okay, the next scenario, how to pick a medication to pharmacologically cardiovert a or a flutter. The first question here is whether the patient is hemodynamically unstable. If yes, then don't mess with drugs, just do an emergent electrical cardioversion. If they are stable, but you still want to cardiovert them for some reason, such as symptoms of palpitations or a difficult to control ventricular rate, you need to consider whether the patient has so-called structural heart disease which refers not just to CHF and LV dysfunction, but also the coronary artery disease and sometimes even moderate to severe LVH. If there's no structural heart disease, then the 1C agents of flecainide and propafenone are options, as well as the class three drug dofetilide. An important caveat that I'll return to in a few minutes is that patients started on flecainide or propafenone should be pretreated with a class two or class four antiarrhythmic in the event the AFib converts to A-flutter. Now, on the other hand, if the patient does have structural heart disease, amiodarone is the most common and probably best option. Once a patient has cardioverted back to sinus, either electrically, pharmacologically, or spontaneously, what is the best medication to maintain sinus rhythm? If there is no other significant cardiac disease at all present, then flecainide, propafenone, and sodalol are all okay choices. If significant LVH is present, for example, from poorly controlled hypertension, then amiodarone is generally used. If they have CAD, then it's dofetilide or sodalol. And if it's heart failure, it's amiodarone or dofetilide. Now, moving away from AFib and A-flutter altogether, let's talk VT. How do you pick a med to pharmacologically cardiovert monomorphic VT? As with AFib, if the patient is unstable, electrically cardiovert them immediately. However, if they are stable, amiodarone, lidocaine, and procanamide are all options. Lidocaine in particular is generally used only in situations of VT in the setting of acute coronary ischemia. And of course, even with hemodynamically stable VT, electrical cardioversion is absolutely still an option but one that carries the downside of requiring anesthesia and sedation. And to pick a medication in patients at risk of recurrent monomorphic VT, ask if they are an ICD candidate. An ICD, of course, is an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. 
If yes, then an ICD is by far the best option, to which a beta blocker is usually, but not always added, primarily to prevent VT altogether and to decrease the burden of shocks. If the patient is not an ICD candidate for some reason, for example, if they have limited life expectancy, then just a beta blocker. If the patients in either situation continue to have a significant burden of VT, options to consider then include adding amiodarone, switching the beta blocker to sodalol, or more commonly, just adding sodalol to the beta blocker already present. One thing regarding the use of amio in this situation is that while it decreases the frequency of VT, it can also slow the rate of the VT when it does recur to below the detection limit of the ICD thus preventing an appropriate shock. For example, if the ICD is programmed to shock any tachycardia above a rate of 150 beats per minute, but AMIO lowers the rate of a patient's VT from 170 to 140, even if the frequency with which the VT is occurring decreases with the amiodarone, that decreased rate is probably not going to be doing the patient any favors because those times the VT actually does occur the ICD will not recognize it as such and will not shock them. So that's always something to keep in mind when giving amiodarone to a patient with an ICD in. At this point, I'm going to quickly run through a handful of less common situations. For termination of AVNRT, first try vagal maneuvers such as a Valsalva maneuver or carotid sinus massage, and if they fail, then move next to adenosine. For termination of orthodromic AVRT, that is AVRT which goes down the AV node and his bundle and back up an accessory pathway, vagal maneuvers and adenosine are also recommended. For termination of an antidromic AVRT, where the reentrant rhythm goes down the accessory pathway and back up the AV node in a retrograde direction, percanamide is the favorite drug, although vagal maneuvers may still help. Procanamide is also the preferred drug for the pharmacologic cardioversion of AFib in the setting of WPW. For prevention of VT and VF in Brugada syndrome, which is an inherited defect in one of the cardiac sodium channels, amio or quinidine are preferred. It's one of the rare situations where quinidine is actually used in the 21st century. Prevention of AVRT, either orthodromic or antidromic, metoprolol or other beta blocker, and last, for prevention of pre-excited AFib, 1C agents flecainide or propafenone are good choices, but only in those patients who do not have structural heart disease. Next, I'll move on to discuss three classic pitfalls of antiarrhythmic therapy. The first is the most common of the three, treating an unknown wide complex tachycardia as anything other than VT. So the problem here is that there are physicians who love to attempt to distinguish unknown wide complex tachycardias that are due to VT from those due to an SVT with aberrancy. The problem here is that the criteria used to do this isn't perfect, and the risks from treating a VT as an SVT with aberrancy are much greater than the risks from treating an SVT with aberrancy as VT. So unless you are somehow absolutely positive that the wide complex rhythm is an SVT, choose drugs or cardiodiversion strategies that are most appropriate for VT. The next classic pitfall, treating AFib in a patient with WPW with a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. So first, here's an example of what this truly ugly rhythm looks like, a wide complex, irregularly irregular rhythm. There are very few things that cause this type of rhythm, and pre-excited AFib should be your first consideration. The problem with using a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker here is that those drugs primarily affect conduction through the AV node. They have no impact on conduction down the accessory pathway, which appears to be the primary route for impulses to get to the ventricles since all the complexes are wide. So in the best case scenario, these drugs won't help the patient at all. However, it's widely believed that blockade of signal through the AV node only may paradoxically increase the frequency with which the impulses moving down the accessory pathway can depolarize the ventricles. In other words, giving these patients beta blockers or calcium channel blockers may actually accelerate their heart rate. So instead, they must be treated with drugs that impact both the AV node and the accessory pathway, 
or preferably be given a drug that can safely cardiovert them and don't even attempt rate control at all. So for example, as mentioned a few minutes ago, procanamide. The final classic pitfall is treating a flutter with a sodium channel blocking drug without a concurrent beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. So here we have atrial flutter with a flutter rate, that is the frequency of flutter waves of about 280 waveforms per minute. There is two to one AV block resulting in a ventricular rate of 140. What sodium channel blockers can do is to slow the rate at which the wavefronts of depolarization travel around the reentrant circuit without impacting the AV node. This is a problem because while the AV node might not be able to conduct 280 supraventricular impulses per minute, it might be able to conduct 180 or 200 impulses per minute. So this is what can result. After treatment with a sodium channel blocker, they have slowed the flutter rate down to 200 waveforms per minute, which is the same as 200 impulses hitting the AV node per minute, which in younger patients it actually can conduct. So instead of having 2 to 1 A flutter with an overall ventricular response of 140 beats per minute, we have 1 to 1 A flutter with an overall ventricular response of 200 beats per minute. And that is most certainly not an improvement. So when starting a class 1 drug in a patient with a flutter, always put them on a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker before or at the same time. I hinted at this problem in lesson 2 when mentioning the so-called pill-in-the-pocket approach to paroxysmal AFib, in which patients take a 1C drug on an as-needed basis for palpitations. These patients should also be concurrently treated with AV blocking drugs as well, in the event that those palpitations are actually from a flutter and not a fib, which frequently coexist in the same patient at different times and which may feel identical. So that's all the information on antiarrhythmics I'm covering in this series. Here's a chart that summarizes the most important information that I've presented about each of the drugs, excluding atropine, isoproteranol, and evabradine. Don't worry, I'm not going to read through the table, but it's here if you want to pause the video and take a screenshot or just test your memory. And finally, these are my five main general takeaways from the whole series. First, antiarrhythmics are a large, physiologically complex, and pharmacologically diverse collection of drugs. The standard classification system is simple and has not been improved upon in 50 years, but it fails to adequately capture this complexity. All antiarrhythmics are also proarrhythmic, particularly class 3 drugs and digoxin. Although appropriate indications for some drugs can be easily deduced from first principles, you probably have already noticed that this is not true for all of them. Unfortunately, many drug indication pairings just need to be memorized. Last, as a general rule, due to their lower frequency of use and less favorable risk-benefit ratio, class 1 and 3 drugs, excluding short-term amiodarone, should only be prescribed after consultation with a cardiologist, provided there is time to do so. That's not to say that there aren't situations in which you should discuss therapy with class 2, 4, or the non-classifiable drugs with a cardiologist. In fact, there are countless situations in which a cardiologist can be helpful at choosing the most appropriate medication in those classes. It's just that with the class 1 and 3 drugs, it's difficult to imagine a scenario in which a non-cardiologist should take it upon themselves to prescribe on their own, outside of emergencies. Even myself as a hospitalist who has a particular interest in electrophysiology, I don't prescribe drugs like sotolol or flecainide without discussing it with the true experts. So that concludes this seven video series on antiarrhythmics. If you found them to be helpful, please consider hitting the like button and sharing these videos with your classmates and colleagues.